Okay, well, hello everyone. This is Sandy. And um, I welcome back those of you who are joining us again. And for newcomers, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, in the first talk, we discussed the reasons that we are experiencing an alarming decline in our bees, birds, butterflies, and other pollinators. And this is primarily because um, we are losing habitat due to development. And what habitat we have is very fragmented and it, it has created a lack of connectivity for, um, for our pollinators to make their journeys, uh, for the butterflies and the bees to make their migrations. And so, um, the result of the habitat loss is that we have lost a lot of native plants. And the native plants are what really sustain within an ecosystem, the wildlife and these very important pollinators. So as a result, the ecosystems are collapsing. Um, there are a lot of researchers who are looking into this and uh, one suggestion that they have is that we as homeowners could really be part of the solution. Um, if, if we can take our quarter, quarter acre uh, properties uh, with whatever beds we have or whatever trees we have or mostly whatever lawn we have and intentionally plant native plants, native trees, native shrubs, uh, we are gonna be able to rebuild these biological corridors that are so essential to helping to sustain um, our wildlife and our pollinators. Let me see if I can get this moving along here. Okay, so there are a lot of pollinators who are endangered right now. And you can see from this picture that we're talking about um, butterflies, bees, beetles, ants, wasps, birds, even bats. Uh, serve as, as pollinators. And we know from research that a local ecosystem uh, sustains itself more smoothly, longer, and, and way more productively if all of those parts are there. And if it turns out that there are some species that are not there, uh, then the whole thing starts to break down. Also, as it turns out, there are some species that are more important in an ecosystem than others for the functionality to really continue. And those two things are plants, native plants and pollinators. So we're going to take a look at how we might consider intentionally building back healthy habitats and healthy, healthy ecosystems in our landscape by looking specifically today at how do we meet the, the, the food needs of our butterflies and um, our native bees. And I'm gonna, I, one of the reasons that these, are, these two are so important is because of the ecological services that they really provide to an ecosystem. Bees are the champion pollinators. There is no insect that does a better and more efficient job of pollinating than, than bees. And there are two reasons for that. They're very intentional pollinators because they feed themselves, but particularly they feed their young on pollen. And so they are driven to go and forage for pollen um, all day long. They pack their nests with pollen so that their larvae have something to eat as soon as they emerge from the eggs. Um, th this is in the case of the bees. Um, the other reason that they're very efficient pollinators is because they have hairy bodies. And so while they're foraging in and on flowers, um, they pick up a lot of the pollen and carry it from plant to plant. So we're familiar with honeybees. We hear all about honeybees that are driven in on great big trucks to pollinate um, you know, our food crops, our big food crops. But most of the bees that we see in our um, gardens are native bees. And so I wanna just talk for a second about the, the, a little bit about native bees because I think a lot of us don't realize, first of all, how many there are. So we have 430 species of native bees in Virginia. They do not sting. The males don't even have a stinger. 
The females do, but you would have to actually grab one of these bees uh, while it was feeding uh, or it was trying to get in and out of its nest uh, before it would, it would sting you. They are not aggressive. I think often uh, people mistake wasps who, who can be a little bit more aggressive um, for bees. Uh, most of our native bees are solitary. They don't like a honeybee. They don't build big hives. They build individual chambers. 70% of our native bees nest in the ground. And so they dig holes in uh, areas that don't have a lot of um, planting on them and uh, build an egg chamber down there. And that's where their eggs mature and the larvae um, emerge and the, the bees emerge eventually. The other 30% build their nests in cavities. Um, so they would be in like a, a, a piece of dead wood or a hollow stem, uh, or even in brush piles, uh, we can find um, them uh, using the cavities of, of what's in the brush to, to nest. Bumblebees create nests in cavities that are underground also, but they form um, a little bit more colony uh, than, than the other native bees. So that's why we wanna look at, at, uh, at our native bees. They're so very, very important to the ecosystem. The next reason um, that we're looking at butterflies uh, is not because butterflies are the most important pollinators, but it's because of the other ecological functions that they bring to an ecosystem. So I just wanna briefly review the butterfly life cycle because it's, in, it's important in designing um, what plants we put in our garden. So an adult butterfly, uh, mama lays her eggs, the eggs hatch and a larva emerges and the larva feed on the leaves of plants and then uh, will eventually usually drop off of the plant they're on, although not always, but they'll drop off into the leaf litter. And at that point, either on the plant or in leaf litter, create a, um, a chrysalis and then uh, hibernate in that for a period of time, it depends on species, uh, and then emerge as a butterfly. The, the food needs of the adult butterfly and the larva are entirely different. And that is very much going to affect uh, how we plant our gardens. So particularly their larva feed the food web. And so um, while butterflies and moths pollinate plants, they do it accidentally because what the adult butterfly is after to feed herself or himself is nectar. And so while they're foraging for nectar, they sort of accidentally um, pull a little pollen off of um, uh, onto the, their scales and they transfer that from plant to plant and, and therefore pollinate. But the real ecological service is providing caterpillars. And the reason that they are so important is that is the most nutritious and the most often used food by birds to feed their young and to feed themselves. So the caterpillars of butterflies and moths transfer more energy from plants to other animals than any other plant eater insect. So they're very, very important as a link, uh, the very beginning link of the food chain. And as you can see in the, in the upper left uh, or the, the left-hand diagram, um, the succession of how that food chain starts at its very lowest level. And guess who's at the end of the food chain? Us. So uh, how it starts and keeping that start healthy is very important. Um, in terms of uh, birds need for caterpillars, 96% um, of North American birds rear their young on caterpillars. So they need thousands of these uh, to, to, to hatch a brood according to some uh, research by um, uh, that's been done at the University of Delaware um, to raise a, a, a clutch of chickadee young, uh, 6,000 6, to 9,000 caterpillars. That's a lot of caterpillars. Um, and the reason they like caterpillars is because there's lots of them. 
We don't see them, but there's lots of them. Uh, they're very digestible. There's no crunchy parts or outer exoskeletons to them. So all of it is consumable and digestible. Um, they're, they're very nutritious, more nutritious than most other insects with their fats and proteins and uh, carotenoids, which birds need for uh, reproduction. So it's an interesting situation between native plants and native insects. In local ecosystems, plants and insects have evolved to be interdependent and mutually beneficial for millions of years. This is an evolution that has worked uh, to the benefit of both. Um, most plant eating insects like bees and butterflies can develop and reproduce only on the native plants with which they share an evolutionary history. And most bees and butterflies are host plant specialists and they only eat one type of plant or plant genera in the larval stage. So the way that this happens is that plants, in order to attract pollinators, uh, produce sweet nectar, it produces pollen, it produces uh, beautiful flowers that are very colorful and attractive, uh, maybe interesting shapes that will allow various kinds of insects to access their nectar. Um, they do this to attract the pollinators, but they also don't wanna be eaten up to the degree that they can't reproduce. So what they also do is produce into their leaves a, a lot of toxin. And so that keeps the leaves from being eaten by a lot of insects. What has evolved is that insects over time have built up by um, exposure to, to a, a lot of these native plants, a tolerance for some of these toxins. And so it has evolved that certain butterfly larvae can only eat or will only eat the leaves of one kind of plant. So why this becomes important is that if we don't pr provide those plants that the larva can eat, we won't have butterflies because mama only lays her eggs on those leaves. And um, so uh, this is where there's a difference between the plant, the food that a larva needs for a, butter, a butterfly larva and the food that the adult needs, which is nectar. Um, as it relates to bees, it's a slightly different story. Our native bees are of two types. Um, some are generalists and they can take pollen uh, and feed their young on pollen from a variety of plants. About 80% of our um, bees are like that. Um, but another 20% of native bees are what are called specialists. In our area, it's actually 30% of our native bees that are host plant specialists and they require the pollen only from certain uh, plant genera that um, in order for them to reproduce and in order for them to feed their young. So this becomes a relationship where if you don't have the plants, you don't have the insects. If you don't have the insects, you don't have anything pollinating the plants. So they both are necessary. And they not only are just necessary, but they, for, for the ecosystem to stay healthy and to function, it has to have both of them in sufficient number and diversity. And so that becomes the importance of, again, how we look at planting in our landscapes, because we need to have enough of certain plants and a diversity of plants. So these next set of slides, I'm going to show you a series of our most popular butterflies. And there are two things that I want you to really focus on um, with these slides. The first one 
is um, the what the hosts are, because you will see the specificity uh, with so many of these species of butterflies. And I also want you to take a look, like in this case, of the larva, because all of these uh, butterfly larvae look very different. And so to start training your eye a little bit to looking for these, or if you see them, to know what you're looking at. I can guarantee you that a larva on any plant is either going to become a butterfly or moth, or it is going to become bird food. So in either case, leave them, nourish them, encourage them, celebrate that they're there, even though they might be eating a little bit of your, the leaves on your plants. So this is the Eastern um, tiger swallowtail. This is the most frequent visitor to our gardens and one that probably most of you are familiar with. The next one that we are most apt to see in our gardens is the great uh, spangled fritillary. And these butterflies, the whole, um, the whole family of flitteraries um, host on uh, our common violets. So things that are right in our lawns. The pearl crescent is probably the third most common butterfly that we'll see. Um, and it hosts on uh, plants uh, that are in the aster, uh, uh, the aster species. The black swallowtail, another beauty, hosts on not necessarily native plants, but on herbs. And so um, the idea of starting to think about planting some herbs that are part of the carrot family, and we'll talk about some of those later on, um, is uh, a way to attract the black swallowtail butterfly. The spring azure, beautiful blue butterfly hosts on the dogwood and the wild cherry trees. The red spotted purple hosts on uh, a broader range of trees, wild cherry, poplar, oak, and birch. So as I said, some are very specific. Some will host on a little bit wider um, variety of, of plants. And then of course the monarch that we know maybe a little bit more about is, you know, we love our monarchs and they need um, only milkweed. They only host on milkweed. So uh, we need to have milkweed in the garden. Okay, so we see that there need to be a lot of different um, native plants, but you know, as it turns out, while all native plants are, beneficial to wildlife in, in probably one way or another because they provide nectar, pollen, berries, nuts, you know, they're feeding a lot. Um, it turns out that in it, for our bees and our butterflies, not all native plants are created equal. That um, after looking at years of research, entomologists have determined that a small percentage of our native plants actually feed um, the majority of food for our, produce of the majority of food for our bees and our butterflies and moths. So as it relates to butterflies nationally, only 5% of our local native plant genera host 70 to 75% of the local butterflies and moth species. So, we really have to know about those 5% of plants because they're critical uh, to building uh, our ecosystems and uh, if we are going to support butterflies and bees and the caterpillars that we so much need from them. Uh, for bees, it turns out that 69 uh, species of our local native bees need pollen from just five plant uh, genera to rear their larva. So even if you have a whole garden of native plants, but you do not include the small number of what we're calling keystone plants, you will not have a garden that can be as productive uh, as one that contains some of the keystone plants. So now I wanna take you through 
uh, not every plant, but a, a lot of these keystone plants. So you become familiar with what they are and can kind of focus on thinking about, do I already have these or where could I put these uh, in my garden? So the first place that we look are to our um, uh, canopy trees. And if you take a look at the numbers that are in parentheses next to each of these uh, types of trees, they are the number of butterflies and moths that these particular trees are hosts to. So this is uh, where a tremendous amount of productivity takes place. The, the, the one, the tree that um, if you had no other tree in your yard to uh, help produce butterfly and moth larva, it would be the uh, oak family. Uh, if you take a look at that picture on the far left, um, this is what it very likely looks like at the top of an oak tree. Now we don't see this because the majority of these caterpillars are actually coming from moths and moths fly at night. And so we don't see all of this activity um, in the evening because you know we're asleep. Um, the other thing is that these trees grow to 50 to 70 to 100 feet tall, and we can't see what's going on in the upper, uh, upper layers of the canopy. But this is what is happening. Now, we don't see these, but the birds do. And so this is where a lot of the bird caterpillar come from. So of all the plants, the, we have 80 species of oaks in North America. And if there were one plant that you could put in your garden, it would be an oak tree. And if you've got an oak tree in your garden, love it and take care of it because it is, um, it is just a, a critical keystone plant. Uh, the, the wild cherry or the prunus uh, genera um, is another one that is highly productive. Uh, we have about 31 species of wild cherry or related um, uh, trees in, in uh, North America. Uh, this is not to be confused with the cherry trees that we have down around the tidal basin. They are Japanese cherry trees introduced and uh, they do not host uh, all of these butterflies and moths. Um, this is this particular one are the flowers on a black cherry and uh, these trees uh, are pretty fast growing. They also are a canopy tree. They grow 40 to 60 feet. Uh, there are other varieties within this uh, within this family that um, maybe a choke cherry or an American plum or two other um, are two other species that um, could also be um, very productive. The birch family are also very productive trees. Uh, there are 16 species in North America. Uh, this one that you see in front of you is a river birch. They are known for their beautiful foli uh, exfoliating bark. Um, they can grow uh, again, you know, 40 to 80 feet, depending on you know, where they're planted. They like water. Uh, they are great to put in areas where you have water. They're, you know, the name river birch implies that uh, they do very well along a river. But if you have a wet place in your yard, this would be a good one to put there. The willow family is another uh, extremely important uh, host plant for butterflies and uh, moths and also uh, pollen for bees. So um, the one on the left, the um, black willow is um, a, a fairly good sized tree. It doesn't grow to a canopy size. Um, and it is um, one that again, can tolerate a little bit of water. Um, it, the willows as in, in general support some of our showiest um, butterflies. If you're looking for a smaller type of willow, the pussy willow is also a lovely, almost shrub size. They're sort of medium sized shrubs up to a small tree. And um, 
the reason that this one is so lovely is because it blooms so early in the season before anything else that it can be providing pollen for those uh, early emerging bees um, before anything else is available to them. Uh, the pussy willow is also a larval host to uh, 18 different butterflies um, or moths. It likes full to part sun um, and it, it has a, a spreading root system. So it's a good, a good shrub or small tree to plant uh, where you might have some erosion or on a hill is it really holds the soil. Two other um, uh, understory trees that you may be familiar with, but also wonderful for our pollinators. Uh, the um, native dogwood, the, the cor Cornus florida. Uh, it's not to be confused with the Cusa dogwood, which is popular around here, but does not support any wildlife uh, or any pollinators. Um, so this one supports the, or is a host for the spring azure butterfly in addition to a few others. It's slow growing, grows 15 to 30 feet approximately. It needs regular water. It does not like drought conditions. <clears throat> so uh, a dogwood is a, a, has a, a beautiful flower on it. Again, uh, these uh, trees that uh, I'm showing you on this page are early bloomers as well. The flowers come out before the leaves come out. And so it's providing pollen uh, early uh, and nectar early for um, our bees and butterflies. On the right is a red bud, uh, an important source of nectar and pollen again for early pollinators. Um, bumblebee queens rely on red buds to start their new colonies. They pack their colonies with the, the pollen from the red bud so that the, the larvae have food when they hatch. Uh, the red bud also hosts 12 species of butterflies and uh, caterpillars. Uh, it does best in sun. It can take a little bit of shade, part shade, um, and uh, it likes well-drained soil. Uh, I didn't mention this, but the dogwood actually prefers to be in a little bit of part shade. It's used to being an understory tree, so it's not, not quite as happy in full sun. The, the common pawpaw is a tree that um, I show you, uh, well, because it's an interesting and an unusual tree and its flower and its fruit, but it also is the only host to the zebra swallowtail. And so it gets an early flower, like the one you see in the picture, this sort of purplish flower, again, providing early, um, early uh, pollen in April and May. Um, and then it gets, if it is cross-pollinated, um, which means you might have to have two or three of these trees on your property, uh, you will get this fruit um, that is a very tasty, sort of um, creamy centered fruit um, uh, that a, a lot of people love. So if you want to have zebra swallowtails coming, um, think about a pawpaw or two. Okay, so they are not the only trees, but the most important trees. I guess uh, of the others that could be mentioned would be some in the, the red maple family are also provide um, hosts for a lot of butterflies and, and moths, but not to the degree that the ones that I showed you do. Um, now we'll talk about a few shrubs that are host plants. Uh, the the um, spice bush hosts the um, spice bush swallowtail. Uh, and you can see the, the larva of that uh, over on the right. Um, it gets, again, early, early flowers before it gets leaves, uh, yellow flowers. Um, it grows to maybe six to 12 feet. Um, it will grow in full shade, or I mean, full sun uh, to part shade. It likes good um, drainage, good you know drainage of its soil, but it can tolerate a little bit of drought once it's established. It flowers in April. So um, again, early, early pollinator um, uh, provider for pollen. Um, 
it, it, the female plants will get red, the red berries. The, this plant comes male and female. So um, if you don't have um, a female plant, you won't get the, the red berries, but otherwise it, it um, provides a, basically the same um, ecological service for our caterpillars. Okay, couple of other shrubs. And in this case, you get a double bonus here. I mean, any plant that can be a host plant and a nectar plant um, is uh, really one to consider. On your left, I call this one uh, bee happy hour. Um, this is called button bush. And it's a, it's a deciduous shrub. It loses its leaves in the winter, but it grows anywhere between three and 15 feet tall and wide. It has a rounded kind of uh, habit to it. It provides nectar for bees and butterflies, insects. Um, every one of those little spikes that you see in, is, is uh, a, a, a flower. And so it is just loaded with nectar. And uh, it, it, when these flowers come out on the tree uh, in the middle of the summer, starting in, well, usually starting in uh, mid to late June, they are just covered uh, with bees. It also is a host plant for a couple of uh, different moths, but likes full sun to light shade, uh, regular to lots of water. It can, it, it can take a lot of water. So um, it, again, a good place for uh, wet areas. On your right uh, is a, a low bush blueberry. So uh, if, if the birds don't get all the berries, you could also get some. Uh, this is a keystone plant for our specialist bees. And it also is a host plant for 288 species of moths and butterflies. Um, it gets white flowers in the spring and then it gets its um, purple berries in June. Uh, it has lovely fall color. Uh, it can take compacted soil. Uh, it can take salt. Um, it grows best in full sun, but can take a little bit of shade. And if you want to have, maximize your production on it, it's best to plant uh, two or three trees so you have some good cross pollination going on. Another lovely um, shrub to consider that serves as both the a host and a nectar plant is called um, New Jersey tea. It gets its name because uh, apparently the leaves also um, make a lovely tea. Um, it is a, an upright, not too tall, grows to maybe about three feet. It's deciduous again, so it will leave it, lose its leaves over the, the winter. Um, but it blooms uh, again in uh, March and April. This plant can take shade. So it likes to grow in shade or part shade. Um, and so it's one to really consider if you have a shaded area that you would like to um, put, put a, a, a nice shrub. Um, it is fairly tolerant of both dry and uh, moist soil, uh, likes well-drained soil. It is a larval host for the spring azure, the summer azure, and a, a, a butterfly called a, a mottled dusty, dusky wing. Also a very good nectar source. Okay, now I wanna talk about some uh, genus of, plant, of flowering plants, of perennials, well, mostly perennials, that are also your keystone plants. If you are going to plant, try to plant any flowers in your garden to, to, to introduce native plants, try to pick something from these three groups of plants. Uh, I'm going to show them to you in the order in which they bloom. Um, so first are the, 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 the group we call sunflowers. They are the high, uh, helianthus, uh, uh, genera, and there are many, many species of these. In, the, in North America, we have over 150 species of sunflowers. And so it's possible for everybody to find something that grows. M many of them are perennial, some of them are annual. Most sunflowers grow to be fairly tall, 
most of them self seed quite easily. So um, you, you buy a couple of plants and then pretty soon um, you uh, can have a, a, a little bit larger plant without having to buy more plants, which is good. They generally prefer moist soil, uh, although some can tolerate uh, a little bit uh, of that is not real good drainage. Um, this uh, group of plants is the most recurring uh, host for uh, specialized bees. In other words, the most number of bees try to get need to get their pollen from this group of plants uh, when they are when they are looking for a specialized pollen. So just to show you a little bit of the variety, I'm going to go through one at a time. I'll tell you just a little bit about each of these. So if we start up in the upper um, left with the woodland uh, sunflower, this one blooms June to September, grows depending on where it is and how much it likes it. It can grow from a, a couple of feet to six feet. So it, it, it can be a very tall, um, a very tall plant. It likes dry soil. It likes sun to part shade. Um, the one below it, uh, the thin leaf sunflower blooms uh, June a little bit later into November. It gets to be about maybe five feet tall. Um, it likes dry, well-drained um, soil, but can also take a little bit of uh, moisture soil. It likes sun uh, and uh, can take some shade. Now this one also happens to be a host plant for a variety of checker spot butterflies and also the painted lady butterfly. So sunflowers also not only are important for bees, but some of them do provide hosts uh, as a host plant for butterflies too. The swamp, uh, the one in the center here, the swamp sunflower only blooms later in the season. It's a September, October, so a fall bloomer. It will go from three to six feet it likes wet soil. So you can put this someplace where you have got um, a lot of dampness or, or even um, uh, this is a plant that sometimes will go into a, a rain garden. It likes sun, but also can take a little bit of, of shade. In the upper left, the sawtooth sunflower. Um, it is uh, blooming from late summer into the deeper fall, August to November. Uh, it grows three to six feet. It can take more soil. Uh, it uh, likes sun uh, more than shade. And it is also a larval host for the checker spot uh, butterflies. And then the one on the bottom, few, loof, few leaf <laughs> sunflower. Um, it, it blooms from June to November. So a long blooming season. This is a shorter one. This is two and a half to three and a half feet tall is all that it gets. So if you're looking for a shorter variety, this could be one. It can take moist and wet soil and uh, also likes the sun. So with all of those to choose from, uh, I'm sure that you can find um, a, a sunflower that would just be lovely uh, in, your, in your landscape. The next family that are also extremely important are our goldenrods. Um, they are uh, a genus of uh, and part of the aster family, um, but they're again in the United States are over a hundred species of goldenrods, and they are the the second most important pollen uh, host for specialized bees. So um, these are another reason why we call them the the keystone plants is because they're so important to our specialized bees. Um, <clears throat> they are also the one that more than any other uh, genus uh, ranks top for being a host plant for uh, moths and butterflies as well. So it, it, um, it has roots that are usually pretty thick and intertwined. Uh, they're great in locations where you, again, are trying to prevent some erosion. Uh, that root system helps to build topsoil. It encourages a lot of infiltration of the rainwater. They're just wonderful, wonderful plants. Everybody should have a goldenrod and so much to choose from. Um, most of them need average garden soil um, with decent drainage. 
Um, but they also can tolerate clay, which we have a lot of in this area. So again, just a quick rundown. Um, the one at the top, uh, autumn goldenrod, is uh, only grows a foot to two feet. It's quite a compact goldenrod. And it um, blooms August to October. So most goldenrods, most will be fall bloomers, but there are some that will bloom earlier in the summer um, as well. But this one is a fall bloomer, uh, full sun to part shade. Uh, the next one over uh, to the right, early goldenrod, uh, is a little bit taller. It grows three to six feet, uh, and, but it blooms early. It will start blooming in June, in July and August. So it's more of a summer bloomer, and it also likes sun. Uh, the gray goldenrod, which I think is uh, down here, yeah. Um, uh, this one is also not a real tall goldenrod. This one grows uh, up to a couple of feet. Um, it is a summer bloomer also from June through the early fall, September, October. Uh, it can take a little bit of shade. It doesn't need full sun all the time. Um, the next one, showy goldenrod, uh, is, uh, can grow two to seven feet tall. So this one can... I think depending on how much sun it's getting, um, it needs to either be toward the back of the garden or not. Um, but it's also a late summer fall bloomer, August to October. It likes sun. And then this last one that I'm showing you, the zigzag goldenrod uh, grows from one to three feet. It is also a midsummer to fall bloomer and uh, can take sun and shade. So just a little bit of variety of some of the native goldenrods that we have in this area for you to choose from. And then the last very important keystone family of plants uh, are the asters. The asters are uh, most important for both bees and butterflies. Um, they support specialized bees, uh, and they also um, support over 100 species of um, our area caterpillars, including the pearl crescent, which is pictured in the middle. So we'll start here in the upper, uh, the upper right with um, the New York aster. Uh, the New York aster will grow um, three to five feet. It likes well-drained soil. It can take clay soil. It likes a sunny location, but also can take part shade. Um, it doesn't grow quite as tall as some of the asters. And so um, it can be put sort of in the middle or even toward the front of, a, of an edging bed. Um, the New York aster or the New England aster uh, is one that is maybe one of the most familiar ones to us. It's quite available uh, in this area. Um, this one also can grow uh, from three to seven feet. Um, you can control the, um, the growth on this uh, a little bit by cutting it back halfway in June. I often do that with my, with my New England asters and it causes them to bloom just a little bit later, um, but it keeps the growth uh, down a little bit and, and keeps the plant a little bit fuller. So it can grow in the shade. It likes part shade and tolerates clay soil and wet soil. It does not like drought. So this one you have to keep watered. Uh, in the middle here is uh, the blue aster, the blue wood aster. This is not a tall aster. Um, this can be as short as two feet, maybe go up to four feet. Um, it uh, blooms um, these beautiful pale blue and violet blooms uh, June to November. It grows an average dry to moist um, soil. It prefers moist soil, but it needs to be well-drained. And uh, this one tolerates shade quite well. So this would be a choice if you have a shady area. The smooth aster is two to four feet. Uh, it it uh, doesn't bloom until the late fall, September into the late fall. Uh, Well-drained average garden soil is what it likes. Uh, it can take full sun to part shade. 
And once it's established, it, it will actually tolerate a, a pretty good deal of drought. Um, and then the aster at the top, the aromatic aster. This is a shorter aster, a little bit bushier aster. It grows one to three feet. It blooms late summer, early fall. Um, and it uh, can take drought, it can take clay soil, it can take dry soil, it loves sun. And you know, because so many of the asters bloom in the fall, uh, this is not a plant that you necessarily need to buy uh, right now. We, you know, we run out in the spring and try to get all of our plants that we can um, and, and, and get them into the ground. But with the asters, you can wait a little while and you may find actually that there's more variety to choose from um, if you wait until midsummer or later into the summer um, to, actually, to actually plant them. So those are our three real keystone families that I want you to really consider um, bringing into the garden and especially the goldenrod and asters which provide that late summer and fall um, uh, nectar and pollen for uh, the bees and the butterflies that are still around at that time of year. So now we're going to look at a few more host plants. Um, just uh, so that you have more, more considerations as well. So these are two plants that you're probably finding in your lawn if you're not you know, putting so much um, herbicide on it that, that you kill these. Um, white clover uh, is actually not a native plant. It, it was introduced here centuries ago, but has become a plant that um, has naturalized without us interfering at all. It just comes up and it, it's, it's often found in, uh, in grass seed or, or, or growing up in grass. So I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen this in your, in your grass. Um, this will grow in full shade or, to, or part shade or full sun. Um, this little teeny plant uh, it just it pulls uh, nitrogen into the, out of the air and into the ground. So it's a great nitrogen holder. It's host to a variety of sulfur butterflies and also this lovely um, Eastern tail blue, tailed blue it's called, and it's also a pollen and nectar plant for bees. On the right is the common uh, violet. We have 30 varieties of uh, uh, these native species of violets in Virginia. Um, so the common ones are usually purple or white but you may see out in, in nature, uh, in the woods, other, other colors, cream colors and pinks. Um, it provides nectar for bees and is the only host for the fritillary family of butterflies. Um, and this one will grow in part to full shade. So again, if you can start getting violets uh, growing in some of your shaded areas, it makes a great ground cover. Um, instead of ivy or some of the other invasive ground covers. And it sows on its own. Once it starts, it, it will keep expanding on its own. So two that you don't even have to buy, they're probably in your lawn. Uh, another one that we already are a little bit familiar with, the milkweeds. Um, this is a, an essential plant for hosting uh, the monarch butterfly, but it also is a very important nectar plant for all kinds of butterflies and bees. Um, the one on your left, the um, butterfly weed, is uh, a, a shorter plant. It grows maybe to two to four feet, uh, gets these beautiful orange flowers on it. Um, and uh, the swamp milkweed on your right uh, grows a little bit taller than that. That can get up to, oh, five or six feet. So a good one, again, for the sort of the back of the, of the garden. Um, the one that I have not mentioned here is the common milkweed. And that is also a, a, a very important host plants for, um, for butterflies, for the, for the monarchs. But that one is a lot more invasive. And so if you have got limited space, then these are the two that I recommend because they do not spread uh, like the common milkweed does. Um, so if you've got a lot of space, you can start planting common milkweed, but otherwise check out these two and, and plant these two. One thing I will say about the, um, 
the butterfly weed, it has a tap root. And so once it's planted, it doesn't really like to be transplanted very much. So put it uh, in a good sunny spot where, um, uh, where it's going to like it. Okay, field thistle. Thistle <laughs> is the host, uh, host to the painted lady butterfly. Um, and uh, it likes full sun, moderate water. It grows two to four feet and then gets these uh, beautiful purple bulbs, bulb-like flowers, spherical flowers on it. It blooms midsummer to late fall. It is also a taproot, so a little bit difficult to transplant or to, or to divide. Uh, on your right is the white turtle head. Uh, this plant grows two to four, two to three feet. It's a late summer fall bloomer. It likes um, moist and wet soil. So again, if, if you've got a place where there's a lot of moisture um, or if the soil really gets wet and stays a little bit wet, um, this plant should do well there. Uh, it's it's a, a stiff, erect plant that then gets uh, this head of, um, of uh, uh, flowers on the top of it. Um, it likes part shade and it is the larval and nectar source for the Baltimore checker spot butterfly that you see um, in, the, in the picture. And uh, hummingbirds also very much like this plant. Okay, two more host plants that uh, you can consider. The uh, one on the left is the Black Eyed Susan, uh, not an unfamiliar plant. We see a lot of these. We, heard this name. Uh, Black-eyed Susans like sun. They like moist, uh, too dry soil. They can take both, but it needs to be well drained. Uh, they grow two to four feet. Again, there are um, a variety of, of uh, uh, Black-eyed Susans and Brown-eyed Susans in the market. Um, it is a host larval for or a larval host for the checker spot and a few other butterflies and also a nectar, um, a nectar plant uh, for bees and butterflies. And then the seed heads, um, if you leave these after they die back, if you just leave the seed, uh, the, the flower head, the birds really enjoy the seed heads on these. And the plant on your right, this evening primrose is a plant that is again, a keystone plant for specialized bees. Um, it has got a kind of a lemon scent to it. It gets these large yellow flowers on top of a very erect stem that grows two to six feet. Uh, this one, if by its name, you might uh, assume uh, it opens up at night and then it's closed again by noon the next day. Um, so it it, it takes two years for its life cycle. So the first year that you plant it, you may not get um, blooms, but the second year you will. And it is a pollen, that it gives off pollen that is required by 11 of our specialized native bees. Uh, we mentioned earlier about the carrot family and how the Eastern black swallowtail uh, needs um, uh, some of these herbs. We that we would consider more herbs than native plants that are part of the carrot family. So on your left is a sweet fennel. Um, it flowers um, in August uh, into the fall, and then it's got seeds that ripen um, it also in the fall. It prefers well-drained soil, but it can tolerate drought um, and it likes full sun. All of these herbs will, will need full sun. Uh, the other one is dill, which we're familiar with. It also flowers uh, in the late summer and early fall. It attracts a number of beneficial insects um, and um, it likes full sun. Uh, the one that I have not shown you a picture of, but uh, that is in the same family are, are, are the parsleys. So uh, even putting a couple of parsley plants out in, in your garden uh, to share with the, with the pollinators would be great. Now we're going to look at a couple of nectar plants. These are plants that provide um, uh, a, a really good source of nectar and in some cases are um, uh, needed by um, 
uh, specialized bees. So the one on your right is the sweet, uh, sweet pepper bush, also called summer sweet. It's a deciduous shrub, likes wet to moist soil. So I've really shown you a few here that are gonna be great if you have um, spots in your lawn or in your beds that um, collect water and, and keep water. It, it likes partial to full sun. It flowers uh, in the middle of the summer, July to August. It's a fairly slow growing uh, plant and can grow from uh, three to eight feet. The one on your left is uh, common blackberry. So maybe you'd like to try and grow um, a little bit of fruit that not only uh, is good for the pollinators, but that you can consume. Um, so it, this gets white flowers in the spring, uh, in late spring, early summer, and these are what turn into um, blackberries. They fruit out in the summer. It, this is quite drought tolerant. Um, it likes full sun to light shade. It needs rich fertile soil, but it can uh, survive in a more clay loamy type of soil. Um, it sends out canes, which uh, the flowers come onto, um, but the canes will also bend over and replant. So this can be a spreader. So you want to plant um, a blackberry where it's got a little bit of room to grow. These are some early nectar plants and I show you these because it is important to have uh, plants that, that are providing nectar uh, for our early pollinators in the same way that some of our the host trees that we talked about earlier. So on your right is um, the Virginia bluebell. Uh, this is a plant that grows in the shade, grows it's eight to eight inches to a foot, maybe a little bit more than a foot tall. It flowers March to May. It likes well-drained moist soil and it is um, uh, very important for um, the early pollinators. I, I was out in Riverbend uh, not too long ago and watching bees just crawling, diving into these little bell-shaped flowers um, to get at the nectar and the pollen. And then on your left is a, a, a plant, a, a spring ephemeral called Spring Beauty. Um, this one is low to the ground again, uh, four to 12 inches, and it likes part shade, it likes moist soil, um, both of these are plants that you will find out in, in the forests, in the woodlands. Um, it's an early bloomer and um, it will disappear after it blooms and as it starts getting warmer, it will disappear out of your garden. So, um, uh, but it, it, you know, you, you, you can have things growing around it so you don't even notice that the space is missing, but very important for providing food uh, in the early spring. Uh, these are more summer nectar plants. Um, on your left is Joe Pie Weed. Uh, that is a native wetland plant. Again, it likes wet to moist soil, uh, partial to full sun. It's a fairly tall plant. It can grow you know, up to 10 feet if it likes where it is, but may not grow that high. Mine grow maybe five or six feet. Um, it gets these beautiful um, purple flowers on them. And this again is a bee happy hour. Uh, this thing is covered in, in the summer with, um, with bees taking the nectar and the pollen from it. And on your uh, right is uh, another one that is a little bit familiar, the cone flower. Um, the, this one likes full sun, uh, moist to well-drained soil, uh, can be quite drought tolerant also. Uh, it blooms um, in June and July, grows maybe two to five feet. Uh, and uh, this one is also one that the birds enjoy the seed heads on. So leave these out after, you know, don't cut these back in the fall. Uh, leave the seed heads so that the, there's food for the birds over the, uh, the winter. Okay, two more. Uh, the Coreopsis. Uh, this is, a, a, again, a, 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 a 
part of the Aster family. This particular Coreopsis, and there are many of them again, um, some are both annual, some are perennial. This particular one is a perennial. Uh, they like full sun, uh, a little bit to moderate water. So they, they're good drought tolerant plants. This one grows uh, fairly low to the ground. It's, it only grows maybe to a foot or two um, and gets this lovely foliage. And then once it uh, starts to die back, I cut mine back by about half after that first flush of flowers. And I very often will get a second uh, lighter bloom uh, as we go into the fall. And then on your right, uh, the New York ironweed. This plant needs full sun uh, and wet to moist soil again. Um, it blooms August to September and grows five to eight feet. This one can look a little bit more like a shrub than, um, than just a plant. Uh, so because it grows tall again, it's good toward the back of a bed where maybe it's got some lower plants that are helping to support it a little bit. But a very important nectar and pollen uh, host for specialized bees. And then the last two nectar plants that I'm going to show you are the Minarda. Uh, Minarda likes full sun to part shade, uh, medium to wet soil uh, it, that sort of retains its moisture, but it, it can grow in clay, so it, it grows well in our soils. Uh, it flowers in June uh, to August, and or July to August, I'm sorry, it's not quite in bloom yet. Uh, usually grows two to four feet. Um, if you deadhead these, in other words, once the plant, the flower dies back, if you cut it off, uh, sometimes you'll get a second bloom. I often do. Um, and so uh, this is also a flower that hummingbirds love, as you can see in the picture. Uh, and the one on your right, the Leatris, uh, also called Blazing Star, uh, this is a spike uh, flower, and it likes uh, partial to full sun. Many of these nectar plants like sun. Um, uh, it likes wet to well-drained soil. So it can, it can tolerate drier soil, but, but it needs to be well-drained. Um, and uh, it, it blooms uh, from June through September. And these spikes get to be anywhere from maybe two to five feet, depending on uh, the species that you have. So we've given you a lot of selection there. I've tried to point out the plants that are the most important, the ones we call the keystone plants, uh, and would encourage you, if you are going to start with anything, start with those, but there's so much more that you can provide and you can see how, uh, how much diversity and how beautiful these native plants are. So we wanna think about planting for diversity and sufficiency. We, we saw earlier that that is very important for an ecosystem to continue. Uh, to thrive. And so to the degree possible, plant as many different types of native plants as you can. You know, when you look at some of these pictures, you will see, I can't see quite what this is, but we've got three or four or five varieties of plants um, growing in, in, in this area. And the reason for that is because you see how specific many of these butterflies are and bees are to the plants that they need. So the more diverse we have, the more variety we have, the more chance we have of, of um, attracting uh, a diversity of the butterflies and bees that we want to bring back. If it's possible to plant more than one plant of a species, that is also a preferable way. And if you look up here, uh, you can see what I mean by that, that this is an area um, and the, the research says clusters of maybe three feet by three feet are the most ideal. Now, the reason for that, where do they come up with these numbers, right? Uh, the reason for that is that when plants that a particular bee or butterfly are looking for uh, to feed on, uh, if there are a lot of them in one area, 
they don't have to fly as far to get what they need. So it conserves their energy. And so this is something that's, that it, the reason for it is because it's beneficial uh, to the pollinators. Now, if you can't plant a big cluster, then the idea looking down here of having a variety fairly close together, so that's not a big cluster right next to each other, but you've got a couple of different types of asters here, and then um, it looks like some sunflowers uh, uh, or some black-eyed Susans, I can't quite tell, um, but you've got those uh, near one another. So again, it's going to serve the same purpose of conserving a little bit of energy for the pollinators. So those are things to keep in mind um, when you start thinking about taking some of these plants and putting them um, into the ground. You also want to think in terms of layering. We saw that uh, host plants exist from the tallest trees to the ground covers of violet. So trying to build a habitat that has trees, that has understory trees, that has shrubs, that has flowering plants that are, you know, a sort of a mid-size two to four feet, and then having things that are closer to the ground is really the ideal way to build uh, a landscape that is um, a wildlife habitat. <coughs> The last thing that I want to stress that is important is what we call continuity of blooming. So we have got pollinators that start coming out as early as February and March, and we have got bees and birds uh, that are still by November making their migrations. And so we need to provide food and hosting plants for these pollinators from early spring right through the fall. So this is what I mean by continuity of bloom. So try to put plants in that are, try to always have something in bloom. And we're gonna send, we're gonna attach this specific chart uh, to the uh, email that we send out with the recording so that you have a copy of this because it's a very good guide about what is blooming at what month of the year. Uh, and so this will be very helpful in helping you to achieve that goal of always having something in bloom. And then the last thing, because we get a lot of questions about this, the last thing that I wanna talk about as it relates to native plants are the straight species, the things that are the true natives versus what we call cultivars. Now, most of what you are going to find when you go to um, a commercial nursery like Maryfield or Meadow Farms or even, you know, the big box stores, they may have native plants, but they may not have straight species of native plants. They may have something that is a cultivar of a native plant. Now, how are you going to tell the difference? Well, in the little spikes that are in the plants, if it is a straight species, it will have the species name and maybe its common name. If it is a cultivar, it will have the species name of the native, the species, you know, the straight species name. But then in uh, single quotes, it will have another name. And that is the cultivar name. So what that means is that a straight species has been taken and it has been genetically modified for some characteristic. Now, sometimes it, uh, there are things that sound very good. Maybe it's a little bit more disease resistant. Maybe it is going to be slightly different color flower. Maybe it's going to be uh, a changing the leaf color. Um, it can be a variety of things. It could be uh, trying to, to have it create more or less nectar. Um, and so the question becomes, well, which is better? Uh, and 
when I'm talking about better, I mean better for the pollinators. Better do do, do pollinators with, with a with a cultivar have the same access to what they need from that plant uh, than the straight species? Well, there's been a lot of research done on that um, because uh, cultivars are coming fast and furious through the nursery industry. There's always every season, and you know the greatest new plant. Um, and so what the research has shown is that, uh, or one set of research anyway, that was done by a woman named uh, Baisden, she found that in, in, in looking at the traits that were changed in a, a straight species, that the only thing that really deterred the pollinators in her study was if the green leaves were changed in color to make them red or purple or blue. And so this is, this is some of the kind of changing that they can do. So if the leaf color changed, uh, it affected whether or not a butterfly would then use that plant as a host anymore. So uh, that was, that was um, an important finding. In another study, uh, the, the researcher found that more often than not, if the, the flower color or size or shape changed, if there was something about the flower that changed, it made it less accessible for pollinators. Maybe uh, the nectar wasn't as rich. Maybe uh, the pollen didn't have the same nutritional value uh, as the straight species. So uh, while um, cultivars are going to provide some benefit uh, to the degree that you can find straight species, um, it is going to be more beneficial to the pollinators. Now, these are not as easy to find, um, but one of the things that we also are going to send you are um, some resources and some lists of where you can go in our area to find um, that, that are nurseries that, that uh, have straight species. And most of the straight species are also uh, propagated from seed. This is another thing about cultivars. Most of the cultivars are, are then cloned. And so you have no genetic diversity. Every plant is exactly the same. If it is seed propagated, every one of those seeds has a different genetic footprint. And so you're going to have more diversity uh, and more strength of diversity um, with plants that have been propagated by seeds. So we're gonna provide you or try to provide you with some great resources for where you can go and find the straight species of natives. Um, but um, uh, just, just know and, and be able to tell the differences so you really know what you're buying. So that's all I have to offer you today, uh, but very happy to go ahead and answer questions if anybody has any, and uh, Amy will uh, chip in here too. Uh, so far, uh, we just have one question. If anyone else has any, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, to start us off though, uh, the question is, you said that the common milkweed is invasive. Does that mean that it is not native? Are the other two types of milkweed that you mentioned native? So no, they're all native. It's, it is just in how they spread. Um, so the common milkweed spreads by a kind of a rhizome that, that moves underground. Um, the swamp milkweed um, will um, not, not grow in that way. At Nord and and the um, the butterfly weed it, it, it grows with a tap root, so it doesn't spread either. But they're all native. Amy, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think I think basically you probably meant to use the term aggressive, because um, that's the way we describe plants that just they kind of take off, but they're not they're not invasive in the way that we think of invasive plants, which are plants that actually can harm the, um, the ecosystem that they're in, plants that are non-native and that can harm and have uh, 
you know, specific economic damage to the ecosystem. So yeah, that's all I had to say on that. The other thing I want to say is I am one of the things you'll also get from us is I put together uh, a list of all the plants that Sandy has discussed. So you'll have that list too, um, so that you can um, use it uh, when you go looking for your own your own uh, your own plants. Does anybody else have a have a question or a comment? There's so few of us. I almost feel like if people wanted to just unmute themselves and ask, it's. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Has anybody? Uh, how many of you already have some of these in your in your yard? Out of curiosity, are we speaking to the choir here? <laughs> I I added two local plants to my garden. Uh, after the first session you guys hosted. <laughs> what did you put in? I will have to admit, I don't remember the names. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, That's I am wonderful. too. Oh, great. And we do have one uh, comment here that just says, thanks so much and that this has been very helpful. Okay, good. Um, Amy, do you want to say a little bit about what you're going to talk about on the next uh our, on our last talk sure yeah so on uh the 27th the thursday the 27th i will give um the talk on uh, landscaping like it matters and i will pick up on where sandy had uh introduced the at least four different kinds of habits we have about how we landscape in our yards and give you some more techniques on things you can do to uh change you know the productivity of your yard uh, some of them you can even do without buying a single plant because you know if you have changed the dynamics of your yard you actually may start to find that you are the happy recipient of some um, volunteer natives so uh, we'll I'll have a few minutes to, to talk about that too so you could be able to identify a few things that might come into your yard and know not to rip them out because they're worthwhile Okay, well, uh, last call for questions. Um, it, if, if no one else does, uh, then I will certainly thank Sandy and Amy again for a wonderful presentation. And um, as Amy mentioned, uh, we'll be sending out a quick follow-up email uh, early next week with uh, some suggested reading again and, and some of the resources that they mentioned tonight and also a link to tonight's recording. Um, and um, Anyone who signed up for tonight should automatically receive a new Zoom link uh, for the third and final session, which, um, as Amy mentioned, will be on May 27th at 7 p.m. And um, we'll again send out the Zoom link for that final session the day before. So um, if, if no one has any more questions, thank you so much. And I'm going to stop the recording and uh, everybody have a nice night. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much thank to you. the library for having thank us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.